We're already smashing concepts, Cadell, and you're coming okay. right in in the right perfect time. Yeah, All we're right. busy no, like killing. We killing were like kind of nilogy, Yeah, we were like kind of venting. You know, we space. What a silly word is that? You know, a container or hub. What? It's like all these silly words that don't mean anything. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with and you. So, and so now you're coming in, and now you are. You have the space and the container and hub and the we space to smash. Are we, in a, are we in a we space right now? Is this a we space between the three of us? <laughs> we're in a we're in a news space, right? Actually. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I like being in a particle collider of concepts. So, uh, right. Yeah. So, so first, like, how how are you doing, Cadell? And and uh, you know, we we invited you here to talk about your your course, uh, a creed to talk about Lacan. Yeah, no. It was well, something pretty... both me and Tom kind of know, like through secondhand reading, but we don't know his work Osmosis, directly. Yeah. So, so I'm kind of hoping you'll, you'll, you'll educate us a little bit on on the con and tell everybody about your your new course. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, some secondhand Lacanian smoke. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No. Uh. I, I'm doing. I'm doing well. Um. I mean, I. I've mostly actually the course was originally supposed to be. Um, starting July, middle of July, and I pushed it back to the start of September. So I gave myself the summer to sort of uh, take a break from teaching. Um, and that's been been great and uh, just enjoying the summer. Um, but yeah, the 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 course on Lacan's Cree will start uh, September 3rd. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm open to, to talking about anything related to um, Lacan, psychoanalysis, philosophy, yeah, whatever you guys are interested in. Well, just give us like a like a a brief introduction to Lazy Crete. What is that this this piece of work, and and why is yeah. it important? Yeah, no, good question. Um, and uh, well, I'll I'll say it. It is at least in France recognized as one of the most important texts written in the in the twentieth century. I think it made some very famous list of like the greatest books of the 20th century. And I think it's widely recognized as one of the most innovative psychoanalytic works after Freud, uh, also in the 20th century. Um, and in, in many sense, it's, it's interesting, you know, because how much real innovation has occurred in the field of psychoanalysis outside of, let's say, Lacan, Jung, a couple other crucial figures, um, but not much has happened um, in psychoanalysis itself, it seems to me, uh, in the 21st century. Um, it seems like most of the innovation in the 21st century as it relates to psychoanalysis is coming from philosophy, <clears throat> um, not internal to psychoanalysis itself. But the accree, as it's situated in Lacan's career very quickly, so of course, it's one of two major styles of Lacan's work. Uh, he uh, very famously, I think it was for 30 or 35 years, uh, was giving uh, yearly seminars, um, all oral teaching. And he focused on, on oral teaching for the most part. Um, and he would attract uh, in the la in the latter half of his seminars, in the early half of his seminars, it was very small uh, niche uh, audiences. In the latter half of his seminars, he was attracting <laughs> the whole town right? he, was, he was attacked he was attracting crowds right he was he was attracting like people from all walks of life as well and 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 increasingly fewer and he was attracting fewer and fewer psychoanalysts funny enough and he was attracting more and more mathematicians and uh philosophers and sociologists and uh you know people from all walks of life basically uh but the 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 accree is his other form of um work which is his writings of course um and the writings are often seen as more technical they're seen as elitist uh they're seen as uh even more obscure than the seminars so they they have this aura about them of a sort of dense impenetrability and i would like to um change the discourse on that because I think that, I mean, I'm hoping the course goes a long way to making the accree intelligible. Um, and I would say that the dominant theme that runs in the accree now, interestingly, there's three major periods of Lacan's career. There's the, and it goes in this order. It starts with the imaginary. It's middle phase is the symbolic and the last phase is the real. 
Um, and the Acree is published in the 60s, which is smack dab in the middle of his career. So it's, its focus, its emphasis is on the symbolic. And you get this sense right from the beginning of the work that Lacan's job is trying to, and this is, I think, what the Acree is organized towards, even effectively, emotionally. He's upset that the institutions of psychoanalysis have, in his mind, drifted into the imaginary and have lost their effectiveness as a consequence of that. And so he makes a lot of emphasis on the whole field of psychoanalysis is only relevant if we keep it in the field of speech, if we keep it in the field of language, if we lose it to the imaginary, all effectiveness will be lost. Uh, basically, no capacity to really stay true, in Lacan's words, to the discovery of the Freudian unconscious. And of course, what orients his entire work is the return to Freud. And so throughout the Acree, he's emphasizing, um, you know, reading these secondhand literatures and this is also very true to philosophy portal basically reading secondhand literature is not the same as reading the primary source uh, and so he says basically a lot of uh freudian psychoanalysis has been watered down by secondhand literature um, and that people aren't actually reading the original literature and they actually don't understand the original use of the concepts and so he's trying to really go back to the drawing board, go back to the original ideas that Freud was developing, the radicality, and in some sense, the emotional negativity, the effective negativity of what psychoanalysis is trying to do um, and trying to, I mean, in some sense, it's like a rescue mission. He's, 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 he's saying that psychoanalysis at the time in the 60s in its popularity actually uh, had had at the same time watered itself down to the point of um, uh, ineffectiveness. And so uh, th that that might give you a little bit of the picture of where Lacan's going. And we could talk a little bit more maybe about what does it Can mean? Can you give an example? Me? Like what kind of concepts was he kind of deconstructing or uh, like zoning in on in, in, yeah. the, in the imaginary? Like give like do you have some concrete examples? Also, oh, just going back, absolutely. I'm sorry to interrupt, Tom, but I just want to know what clearly the difference between the imaginary and the real as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so let me just start with the, the concepts was, um, and I think uh, we all know in some sense was the way in which Freud's concepts have become in some sense um, popular speech. Right. Like we all know the ego, the superego, the id. Um, there are a lot of even concepts like transference or in or, you know, the instinct, um, uh, the way in which psychoanalysis uses that. Um, Lacan was basically saying that the way Freud was using these concepts was uh, derived from a very technical, precise use, basically one from the, the clinic and the work in the clinic. Whereas when these concepts became popular knowledge, uh, they lost their original you know, technical understanding and, and, they, and they became watered down by... Po in, in some sense, what Lacan's saying here is very dialectical in the sense that the very success of Freud's concepts was, their, was in some sense their downfall <laughs> because they were so well integrated, because they were so well accepted. And he also goes on a lot about how other fields of the human sciences, um, like sociology, um, uh, clinic, uh, you know, mainstream psychology, um, and other fields, um, had started to reappropriate or misappropriate appropriate some of these Freudian concepts. And so a lot of what Lacan's trying to do is to um, reclaim the centrality of psychoanalysis for what he's trying to approach as a... Isn't that always the, human... the case? Sorry? Isn't that always the case or often the case that these concepts, when they get into the mainstream, that they lose their, their original meaning or like big chunks of their original meaning? Yeah, I mean, I think you see it a lot in physics. I think you probably see it a lot in biology. Um, just uh, off the top of my head, I mean, I think if you were to ask um, a professional physicist if uh, the number of times they hear the, the concept of entropy uh, abused or misused. 
sure. for example. So I think in popularization, there is always this um, risk inherent to the field. I think the difference with psychoanalysis as it regards to, let's say, the field of physics is that there's almost no harm done uh, if uh, there's a popular misunderstandings of like the concept of entropy or the, you know, the, the differences between Newtonian, Einsteinian gravity, because as long as the specialists know what they're talking about, and know what they're doing, uh, their experiments are going to go through uh, just fine. It's not going to be interrupted by misunderstandings in popular culture. But that's not so much the case in psychoanalysis because psychoanalysis object is, in some sense, uh, the human subject. Uh, it's not an inhuman object. It's a human subject. And also what also concerns Lacan is he's, and this is, this might be interesting for maybe particularly Sweeney is that it, it seems like a problem that might come up in mystical circles as well in regards to guru figure figures or enlightenment figures is that Lacan's incredibly concerned about whether or not psychoanalysts even exist meaning he's concerned with the training of psychoanalysts mm -hmm. and he's concerned with how do we even know if someone's ready to be a psychoanalyst? And he's also concerned with all of the institutional pressures that go into, Oh, you've got a four year degree. So now you're a psychoanalyst. Like, how do we know you're actually a psychoanalyst, like ready to be a psychoanalyst? And there's uh -huh. very specific things he's working through there um, that, that sort of seem to me to indicate the incredible difficulty in um, cultivating the type of effective disposition. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, uh, I was talking, we were speaking before you came on about uh, somebody named Andrew. Are you there, Cadell? Do we lose you? I am, just one second. I'm, I'm listening. Okay. Um, uh, I was talking to a guy named Andrew Cohen, who you might have heard of, who was a big guru, let's say, you know, around the time of Ken Wilber, was Ken Wilber's best friend, and his whole community kind of collapsed. And then he, he was sort of forced by his students to go to psycho to do psychoanalysis. And he was talking about that. Uh, he was telling me yesterday, we were walking around in, in the forest fund, but he was telling me that what kind of healed him when he talked to the psychoanalysis was the human contact. Like he just needed somebody, he needed somebody to, to connect with because he was, you know, he was kind of destroyed. Right. His life was sort of like in pieces. And he said that the actual content of the psychoanalysis didn't mean anything to him. But the contact with the person was what kind of healed him in, in the first stage. And then he said he went to see Augustus Masters and they were doing all of this sort of, uh, uh, let's say, um, they were doing all of this kind of emotional work all the time. And he said that was good as well. But but is but that wasn't really it, that there was there was a limit to that as well because it was just like you're in the you're in the jungle with a machete working always processing your emotions etc 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 so he was describing the limits of those two forms of psychoanalysis um, and and kind of so so because he wanted to go back to like the spiritual thing which is what matters to him the, the most right but obviously had some problems as as a as, as a you know, quote-unquote guru um anyway that's just to say i i'm wondering about the connection with like what if that's part of lacan's insight is like okay these things are being co-opted and, and psychologized and and, and they, they, they they work on a very limited limited you know in a very limited way does that make sense yeah, no, it does. I mean, I think that the, there is there is this concern with the, um, I guess in, I guess in in Zizekian terms is like the, because there's a lack in the big other, and I think this this uniquely applies to the the spaces that you're interested in, like with uh, figures like Gurdjieff and 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 others, uh, you know, figures like like Osho, is that because there's no big other that. It's easy for people to um, exploit that space of the guru. Mm -hmm. It's easy for people to to pretend to to LARP uh, to uh, to manipulate um, yeah. in that space. Uh, and and specifically, what's going on in the manipulation, the exploitation of this space, is the space of uh, of transference. Is the space of emotional. You know, uh, uh, you're dealing with people oftentimes who are 
whether they're on a spiritual search, whether they're uh, just looking for some uh, mental health, uh, concerns about their mental health, you're often dealing with people who are in an in incredibly vulnerable space. Yeah. And so the, the, the possibility for malpractice and the possibility for abuse is, is quite, quite high. I did want to quickly refer to what you were saying, Sweeney, earlier about can you give specific examples of what Lacan is talking about? Mm -hmm. um, so th there's, I can do it very quickly. So there were, there were three major... So basically, after Freud died, there was the, this association called the International Psychoanalytic Association, the IPA, which is still in existence today. Um, and there were three major schools uh, that had developed, uh, and Lacan goes uh, after each of them in, in turn. And basically, uh, I can go through each of those schools. So there, there's the ego psychology school, which was basically trying to normalize the idea of a healthy ego. Mm. Um, and uh, Lacan took issue with this because he said, if you actually pay attention to how we should define the ego in, in Freud's original terms, is that the ego is on the one hand on the level of the imaginary. The ego is just imaginary, <laughs> which uh, it would mm -hmm. make sense in mystical mm -hmm. traditions, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the ego is nothing but frustration. So it's just the ego is a result of frustration. And uh, I could go into Lacan's theory about why that is and stuff like that. Um, usually it's, or mostly it's about the, um, the original impotence of the body, how we're born in, in, we're born in a body which is impotent, can't do anything. Uh, and the ego is in some sense a reaction formation to this impotent body for Lacan. But mm -hmm. the idea of a healthy ego is a contradiction in terms for him. So that's the first thing. That's great. Yeah, that's the true. <laughs> the, sorry. The, the second thing is that there was the Kleinian school. And the can Kleinian I, sorry, can, I, can, I, can, you, sorry, can you explain that? Because in my understanding, the frustration of the ego comes, um, and I may be wrong, because it always has to mediate between the super it and the, the super ego and the it. And this is like a, a situation where you can't be happy because on the other side, you are able to do some things with your body. Mm -hmm. You can fuck, you can eat you can roll stones up the hill and do it again and again and again. So there are some things that you can do. So, yeah. We, we... So, so, well, I, I was just going to say that, yeah, I mean, I do often conceptualize the ego myself as sometimes caught between a rock and a hard place between the superego and the id. Right. Um, uh, I just going, and that there is a way in which the ego, um, like, you know, I suppose if we were going to play with the word healthy ego, I would say that the ego's best function is to work with the contradictions of the id and the superego. Mm -hmm. um, but what he was against was this idea that the ego was somehow strong and 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 healthy on its own. Right. Uh, could could basically what he was against was the idea that the ego could dictate the terms of the id or overcome the id or mature the id, you know, like or or right. as it were. Or, or as it were, be conscious, totally conscious of the of the superego. Is like this is uh, these these are not possible things uh, for Lacan. Is that it, it's kind of it's always kind of a contradiction the, the ego. And and I and I guess yeah, that's that, that that's how I try to think about the ego. Is I try to fight against my ego to to work with contradiction. Right. Uh, but that's uh, anyway. That's that's one way to think about it. So. Um, the Kleinian school, and this might be interesting to you guys, is the Kleinian school, uh, Lacan had a lot of sympathies with the Kleinian school um, because it wasn't so much focused on the ego, it was more focused on bodily drives, and, and Lacan was sympathetic to that. However, he thought the Kleinian school was too focused on uh, the child-mother relationship um, and at the expense of the importance of, paternal, of the paternal normativity or paternal function. Um, so in some sense, the, the bias there is actually, and we could talk about the way in which the Kleinian school had an over-dominant relationship of the child's drive body and its image-based attachment with the mother and neglected the, the importance of, a, a broadly speaking, a symbolic function to, uh, let's say, liberate towards individuation. Are you talking about Melanie Klein, right? Yes, yes. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. So Melanie Klein was basic, and, and again, Lacan's very sympathetic to a lot of Klein's work, and there is a lot of great Kleinian scholarship. 
he's just his critique here is again going back to the relationship between the imaginary and the symbolic he's saying that the school is grounded too much in image based attach childlike image based attachments of the drive body with the mother and it's not processing the negative emotions the negative affects that will be required to assume a symbolic function in the world basically to grow up <laughs> and and that's more linked to of course paternal normativity um and 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 processing the oedipal complex and uh, uh, you know a lot of what lacan's trying to do is um work through developmentally the Oedipal complex, not to reify the Oedipal complex as a final or eternal structure, but to um, accept that uh, there is a certain relationship between the masculine and the feminine, which the child needs to uh, process. And um, right. assume... so the, the, the Klein school was too based in the mother. It was too feminine, so, so to speak. And that, that, yeah. this lack of masculine uh, principle. Yeah. And, and for Lacan, that would be mostly articulated with the relation between the imaginary and the symbolic. Hmm. Can you unpack that a bit? I'm not sure I'm getting it. Well, the imaginary is uh, basically the um well I, in regard in regards to the feminine and the in in regards to the, the feminine and the masculine it's it's i'm always skeptical to just put a complete overlap between the feminine is is imaginary and the masculine is symbolic although mm -hmm. there is some truth to that it seems to me because the feminine does play up the image um the feminine does in some sense rely on the image as for example masquerade Mm -hmm. um, whereas the masculine does rely on narrative. Uh, it does rely on, on symbolic articulation. Yeah. Um, so the, the, basic, the basic idea there as it relates to the over-dominance of the image is basically in moving from the image to the symbolic, there's a lot of negative affects as it relates to uh, detachment from your original fixations. Right. So you have this, the baby had, so going back to this idea that we're born in an impotent body and you're, the baby is totally dependent on the mother and the baby will develop imaginary fixations, partial fixations on the mother, the mother's breast, the mother's body being held by the mother, being cared for by the mother. If I cry, if I, if I, it, all these, these infantile affects being immediately met by the mother. Uh, he's saying all of these images of, of wholeness, basically, because those are the basically the images of the mother. The mother is the whole body of the mother, right? The imaginary fusion with the mother. Um, that there's something of a symbolic function which the, the child needs to get a distance from the mother. And he's very critical of the mother in some sense. He likens the mother famously to a crocodile. And that the, in some sense, with the jaws uh, very tightly wrapped around the child. And that the child struggles to individuate in part because of the mother's desire and the question of the mother's desire. Does the mother really want the child to individuate? And the child struggles with this, yeah. right? And then in regards to the symbolic function, it's basically assuming a, um, uh, a certain way of dealing with the lack of the all of the mother, right? So there's different mechanisms. We could talk about repression. We could talk about foreclosure. We could talk about disavowal. These are different symbolic mechanisms, which the mind will develop in order to develop a detachment from that original motherly body, right? Like repression would be, a, you know, you, you, you can't just uh, have a, an immediate uh, ecstatic uh, uh, sexual enjoyment with the, the feminine body. Right. All the time. You can't, you can't do that, <laughs> for example. And, and, and in some sense, the symbolic function. So let me, let me just bring that maybe closer to home is like, what do I do? Well, I'm building a philosophy platform. Well, what are you guys doing? You're developing a parallax education platform and a podcast, right? These are symbolic functions, right? And these symbolic functions in order to work, they need a uh, sort of to be um, let's say, all of our all of our childish emotions need to in some sense be accounted for and sublimated into the symbolic function or else it would threaten the 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 the, the drive of the symbolic function itself 
So this would be the type of thing that Lacan's looking to um, emphasize in analysis is that we, we create an analytic situation where we're not trying to reify the relationship between the child mother like attachment, we're trying to help the subject become um, assume a symbolic function in the world. Then finally, there's the object relation school. And basically, the object relation school focus on the subject's relationship to an object, it could be an ob and let's say first and foremost, it's an object of genital love. Um, the first boyfriend, the first girlfriend, uh, your intimate partner, um, your marriage partner, or many partners, right? An object of genital love. And the problem Lacan had with the object relations theory is that it posited too much the possibility of a perfect harmony or a resolution with the object of genital love. And Lacan was saying, no, there is no possibility of perfect harmony and resolution with the genital object. And at the same time, what's at stake in that is the capacity to be in intimate relationship under the condition that it will always be imperfect. It will always be not a perfect harmony. And how do we deal with that? How do we, how do we work through, let's say, the tensions and vicissitudes of our object relations uh, in, that, in, that, uh, in that level? Is that a segue to the real, in a sense? Yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Totally. So, yeah, that, that's totally right. So, like, so you have this image-based attachment to the original object of affection. Mm -hmm. You have the immersion, you have the acceptance that you, that you are a being in language. You have to be in language. You can't get out of that. You have to assume some sort of symbolic function. And what's at stake in assuming that symbolic function is a confrontation with the real that the real is always going to be imperfect. The real is always going to be, dis there's always going to be disturbances that your symbolic function will have to confront in order to maintain the drive. And that's basically like that, that I mean, that's a, that's a pretty concise picture of what's going on here, at least as, as I read it. Mm -hmm. I, 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 the, the one question I have, I'm, I think I'm getting the symbolic. What I'm not getting that, that well is why the feminine is associated with the imaginary. Well, I'm saying that's, 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 that's question. That's questionable. Um, I, I don't think we need to come. We don't need to create a complete overlap oh, wow. or one-on-one -on -one synergy uh -huh, got between it. Okay. the imaginary and the feminine or the symbolic and the masculine. Although it's, it's tempting and easy to make those connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like the example I would give is the way in which the feminine dresses itself up, creates an yeah. image of itself, right? Like going out on a date or why the hesitation there? Because I, I noticed that people don't like to talk about the masculine and the feminine because they're afraid of reductionism, yeah. you know, in some kind of way, but I don't notice that it's there, you know, it's, you can't deny it. You can't deny that, you know, that the men are hyper conceptual, you know, yeah. tend to be yeah. hyper conceptual uh, and, and that women tend to tend to Absolutely. be more more um you know i mean can you can you an, an image, because like in my in my, pers in my personal conversations i have which are you know with friends and so when we talk about the difference between men and women let's stay let's stay in the profane here so i always notice that women are way more engulfed in storytelling than where men are so if a, if a woman has a certain story about That's true That's what true. what life is and either you're in or you're out you're participating in her story or you don't while yeah. men are way more uh, visually oriented and way more, uh, you know, vision oriented, like also in terms of goals and everything. And so, yeah, yeah. Th th I think you brought like, it up. I think, I think you, I just want to, I think you brought it up. I think that, you know, the examples I've, I've heard you talk about before on the podcast is, um, you know, uh, we're talking about um, those studies on pornography where men are attracted to the vision, the image and right. women are, are mm. they have the, uh, they have the, the, the romance uh, fiction. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They're so, interested so, in, so a, in a it's, full it's, narrative or oh, men so, are interested in the experience or immediate yeah. or something like Sweeney, that. Yeah. This is why we can't collapse the symbolic and the imaginary with the masculine and feminine is because obviously men and women are both. Yeah. But it's just that we have, I think men and women normatively, mm -hmm. normatively men and women have different relationships to both. Whereas like, for example, men are, men are visual in the sense that we're attracted to the vision but the way in which we enact that vision is through being hyper conceptual, the narrative, the symbolic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whereas women put on the image, but they're captured by the story. They're captured by the narrative. 
right? right? Mm -hmm. So we have, so there's, in, of course, the imaginary symbolic works for, for both, but in different ways, it seems. Mm -hmm. Can I ask okay. a general question? Um, just as to and we, I just, and we all have the real, of course. <laughs> yeah. So when, like, fifteen minutes ago, you were talking about the. I think you used the word knowability in psychoanalysis. So when do we know something is true, right? When when is something a real phenomenon, basically? And and so I was wondering what Lacan says to this because you're always you know you have these three categories. When do we know, for example, that woman as a crocodile is a phenomenon? Does Lacan offer some form of meta analysis about how he comes to these concepts or how to deal with the kind of arbitrariness of these concepts? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so some interesting things, I mean, the two main ways, as far as I'm aware, that Lacan's developing these ideas is, on the one hand, directly from the speech of the analytic clinic itself, directly from the speech of subjects who are coming to analysis. On the other hand, it's also obviously clear that Lacan is exceptionally well-read, and he's also playing with philosophical concepts, and he's playing with concepts from literature as well. Um, and so he it seems to be using the analytic clinic to reinvent philosophical and literary concepts. That's what it seems to me that he's doing. Now, one of the interesting things he does in his writing a lot, like the woman as a crocodile, or he'll also call like the, the symbolic position of the king as like a, an ostrich with his head in the sand, which I think is a pretty powerful, funny image. Um, he'll use a lot of organic metaphors, like the crocodile, like the ostrich. Right. Right. He'll, he'll use a lot of organic metaphors, um, which seem to me to have a certain punch or a certain hit. Now, what a, what is the real of these metaphors? You know, do we need to take these metaphors super seriously? I think obviously he's trying to invoke a certain powerful image with the idea of woman as a crocodile. Do, do we need to say, oh, women are crocodiles now? No, that would be silly. But what we're trying to get at with that image is the idea of basically the the Oedipal the the devouring mother, right? Like I don't know if Jung used that term as well. Vagina dentata or what? Right. I mean, the, 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 dentata, yeah. mm -hmm. right. I mean, the, these are terms yeah. that I'm sure appear in 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 mystical and ancient knowledge as well. I mean, in some sense, he's probably just doing something that ancient uh, thinkers uh, already did, was use these types of metaphors to uh, articulate yeah. a. A phenomenon which was uh, difficult to pin down. Well, um, I'm interested in sort of, I mean, our friend uh, Thomas Hummerich has suggested that Lacan is, has a tantric quality to him. Definitely. In other words, he has a, he has a, it's not, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a provocative kind of, kind of style, which it isn't, you know, literalist, <laughs> yeah, that it uh, often is, he used, that, that is, you know, and that the, maybe the problem with how people approach Lacan or how people approach a lot of thinkers is in a very literal way and, and, and not, not being able to, uh, you know, they, they, they hear something like the woman is a crocodile and then they start to attach political, uh, you know, offense to that or, or something like, you know what I mean? Um, so what about, what about Lacan as having this, let's say poetic tantric um uh, what's the word i'm looking for uh provocative quality yeah i mean i totally think lacan is a tantric figure um like if i was to ju if i was to juxtapose lacan and freud i mean i i would i would say freud is the sutra yeah for lacan's tantra i mean and and that that's very apparent in his writing is that lacan's saying look I'm kind of a crazy guy. I'm, he's literally saying, I'm, I'm interested in psychosis. <laughs> like Lacan's like, he's like, I'm, I'm not really as interested in, I mean, he said, of course, he's interested in neurosis, but he's mostly focused on psychosis as his personal motivation. And he's emphasizing, we need to read Freud. <laughs> so he's like, that's the sutra. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. You know? Got it. So then it's clear Lacan is the Tantra. And to me, one of the Tantric qualities is being unrepeatable, right? Being very difficult to mimic. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like that's one of the principle. That's one of the qualities I think of the tantric is being crazy wisdom, crazy wisdom, right? It can't, it, can't it, be repeated. Yeah. Can't absolutely. be repeated. Very difficult to mimic. Yeah. And I think Lacan has that quality and he actually embeds and embodies that quality in his work, which I, I've actually kind of tried to learn from a little bit, which is he had this principle. He never wanted to repeat himself. So he said everything in his seminars would just be contingent, uh, spontaneous, organic coming out. And he never wanted to do the same lecture again and again. He's going to give a lecture once and it could be transcribed. You can look at the seminar or whatever, but yeah. he's never going to do it again. That's Miles Davis was like that. He, he, he he's never like played his old stuff. He never ever played, you know, uh, he never yeah. played tonal jazz after he was, when he was doing jazz fusion, he refused to go back to his old material. Uh, very few people uh, do that. Yeah. So he is kind of like a jazz musician, a musician in that, in that sense. Uh, is and, he is a better he orator that. than he's a writer or like how would you how or is he a lot of writer? people a lot of people say that a lot of people say that um a lot of people say that he was his so a lot of people treat the seminars which are the oral materials with more seriousness than they treat the accree which is the writing materials which is a weird phenomenon because it's like uh I mean, the same phenomenon phenomenon is, is kind of true for Peterson, who is like a way better orator than he's a writer. And I, I, <laughs> yeah. I presume, and that's just a fan, that's just my thinking, my imagination, but I think also Hegel was a better orator than it was a writer, you know, because he was like mm. so under stress with writing, he had to finish the manuscripts. And so, but he probably was very captivating in the, in the seminars. You know, there's, there's, there's like, no, I mean, there's funny jokes, right? I mean, you're probably aware of the funny jokes about the relationship between Schopenhauer and Hegel, where sure. Schopenhauer would have a one person show up at his lecture and everyone right. would be at Hegel's lecture. Exactly. So, so, yeah. so there was a way in which people were captivated. There's certainly Hegel, if Hegel was giving a lecture, it was kind of the talk of the town. Exactly. And, and, and in the same way with Lacan. If Lacan's giving a lecture, it's kind of the talk of the town. And you could say the same thing about guys like Peterson. I would also say guys like Zizek, right? Like, I think when right. Zizek, I think Zizek is a great, uh, he's a great performer, right? Let's, uh, you know, Peterson, uh, it, and of course, everyone has different styles, right? And, but everyone has different styles. But I think there's an objectivity of being a good performer, an entertaining performer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I was in, I was thinking when you were talking about his transformation of being sort of, an elitist, you know, philosopher and having a, a niche group to being a, a popular figure in the 60s. I was thinking there's something kind of guru like about Lacan. Definitely. And I felt that when people have been talking about him to me, they, they, they get very excited and they get kind of like passionate about Lacan. And, and I, I don't necessarily understand it because I don't know the language. So I feel like it's an esoteric world that they're it trying is. to communicate to me. And, and yes, uh, it is. when they talk about desire and things like that, and the petite no, it, object uh, or whatever the fuck that is. And uh, I, I think there's no question that Lacan's work is kind of like a liturgy. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Right? Like it, 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 there's something theological about okay. Lacan's work. Okay. Does it work as a liturgy finally? Like like Well, I think internal to the Lacanian psychoanalytic community that might be how it like like people huh. will just read the and and like the and Lacan was trying to um also leave us with um algebra. He he's trying to he's trying to uh, apply algebraic symbols uh, and mathematical equations to the to the mind and leaving us with these uh, formulas like he has formulas of sexuation uh, he has the the formulas of the bard subject and the an object cause of desire all of these formulas are uh, when you just understand the, the 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 algebra of it are very very simple and very very powerful uh, and it's very very hard to see subjectivity or understand uh, discursive relations outside of these algebraic equations that's it's fair enough is a very real uh, thing that happens to a lot of people who study Lacan but what was his relationship with religion basically because I mean Peterson... very complex he was Peterson... his his brother was a Catholic priest mm. he was raised Catholic he was uh throughout his writings self-identified as an atheist 
However, his respect and use of religion throughout his work is plain as day. He's always referring to biblical imagery and, 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 and literature. Right. He, he, he refers very lovingly to figures like St. Paul, um, uh, to, to, of course, Christ. Uh, he engages Buddhism as well. Um, I will say that he did write a text on the triumph of religion at the end of his life. And he predicted that Catholicism would uh, win, win the day over psychoanalysis. Uh, and is, it, is, is that happening? Is, uh, I don't yeah, know. I don't, next question. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't know if that's actually happening. And I actually don't, I don't subscribe to the idea that like the last things a great thinker leaves us are like uh, some uh, supreme wisdom. Like, oh, what did he say on his deathbed? Or, like, what did he say? Right? Like, it could also mm -hmm. just be senile rantings at the end of his life. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. But like, I actually like to go to the to the actually like what I see is like the dense core of like the middle of someone's career. Well, there's an insight there that I think is true. And that is that religion is more powerful than, than, you know, than anything. That's kind of my view that it, that it, over, that it overwhelms all these other uh, things that come along. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, there's a very, it's, I think it's hyper fascinating and I would be very interested to talk about this at length if you guys are up for it, but, it does seem to me, and, and, and Lacan will talk about this, that psychoanalysis in comparison to religion is incredibly fragile um, and uh, in some sense impotent. Um, and religion does seem to appeal to even, even, even to such a deep part of us that even Lacanian analysts can be like religious figures. So you know, what is the ultimate relationship between psychoanalysis and religion? What is the ultimate destiny of the future of our religions? I think it's a totally open question. What about but, the difference between you know, psychoanalysis and psychotherapy? Uh, right. So I think the main distinction there is in regards to some of the theories about transference and the image. It seems like a lot of psychotherapy is grounded in self-help and kind of uh, trying to normativize an idea of health. Um, and also psychotherapy seems like from, I've, I've listened to like, for example, some people who've gone to psychotherapy and I talked to them about what's actually going on in psychotherapy and so forth. It seems to be almost like, to me, it seems to be almost like um, a baby soother for the ego. Like where they just, like, what are you struggling with? Trying to feel okay. Trying I'm to feel of, okay. Trying yeah, to feel okay. Yeah, yeah. Whereas psychoanalysis, if it's grounded properly, is about the negativities of transference. And it's about not, you're not going to go in there and get your ego validated. Yeah, right. You're, you're going to go into psychoanalysis and basically your ego is going to be dissolved. That's the point. So there's a, it's on the threshold of religion in a way. That's kind of what I'm How getting How can the here. ego be resolved? Dissolved. 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 How can that be the case if it's a mediator between these two other forces? Well, I mean, it's like, I mean, there we get into like, I mean, here we get into very weird territory because ultimately, if the ego is this frustrated image, which is kind of like an effect of separation and the desire there and constituted by separation it seems to me like in the transition from desire to drive the ego is kind of dissolved it's kind of like there's no ego there anymore and what is mediating then what is the mediator of contradiction could you just say the self right could you, I, I, I don't know, like I'm, I'm, I'm open here, but like, could, could you, could, is there a meaningful distinction here between the ego and the self? The way I think of it is the ego becomes transparent to itself. So, right. so, so it's, it doesn't go away. I, I think the, the destruction of the ego, cause it, it's kind of has a function. It just becomes subsumed within a larger uh, framework. I think that's how I see it or it becomes you, you can like in the tundric tradition, you would say you wear it as an ornament. You know, it's not the, it's not you. Right. 
I mean, I think the way, at least in which Lacan described it in a certain passage, which I thought was quite powerful, was that what's going on in analysis is that the ego is kind of this, it's actually, there's, there's an image, there's an unconscious image, which is structuring all of your behavior. And this image comes from the first years of your life. It, it, it originates in the first years of your life. And making this uh, as more reflexively, becoming more reflexively aware of, the, of this image, in some sense, determining and dictating your life has has a has a opens up the possibility for a perspectival shift uh maybe quite similar to what you were describing there sweeney with using the ego as more of an ornament yeah and and, and there's a transparency rather than a trans being, being blindly guided by something you know got kind of in a mechanical way like uh yes yeah uh, by something by drives and whatnot okay i have another yeah. question so um it's a little bit off topic but um and my i have a feeling and i have a feeling that way more like less people than claim to have read hegel and lacan actually have wrote uh, read those two people and i think you you are the one one of the few that have actually dug into both of them right so i yes i i mean i can so get, i'm like not i'm not you, a, i'm not trying to to fool anyone i actually have read these uh, figures right <laughs> and so no no it's like but i think the actual amount of people who have read the science of logic it's very very, small. very small. so the question for for the audience is how how do you approach how do you read lacan and hegel so that it becomes approachable how do you how do you approach a text if you had to had to explain what you're doing Well, I mean, in some sense, I'm doing what I'm... So, long story short, I was in my doctoral program and I was deeply unsatisfied with the cognitive science I was learning, the complexity science I was learning in regards to the personal effective dimensions of my life personally. And I was exploring philosophy. And I stumbled upon Zizek's work And I quickly realized the method Zizek was using was a combination of Hegel and Lacan. And so I basically dedicated myself from there to learning the foundations of, of those thinkers. Um, and the reason why I think those thinkers are important is because precisely they speak to the dialectics of knowledge and the unconscious mind. Those are the two concrete. And so ultimately, I don't think everyone needs to read these figures, but I think it's incredibly useful, however you get into this uh, realm, is to take seriously the dialectics of knowledge, and which is to keep your knowledge flexible, but at the same time, paradoxically structured logically. But it, the content is flexible. But can you be more right. precise? Because these texts are famously opaque. Right, so I'm, so, I'm trying. Like, if I was if I was to try to be the simplest possible, it would be. It's very important that we build an educational system which includes dialectical structure of knowledge and includes the unconscious mind as integral for the future of social life and and development. No, I mean, like more precise. What do you do to read the science of logic? Do you go okay. from A to B to Z? Oh, so if if people are interested in reading, right. Oh, so if people are interested in, if people are interested in reading, I always emphasize uh, active, active reading. Like I always give the, meta the Nietzschean metaphor of a lion with a gazelle. Like if you're not a lion with a gazelle, like a, li like a, a hungry lion chasing a gazelle, sure. you're not reading it right. right. In, my, in my view, you have to be an active reader. So there has to be an a priori passion there to, to get into this stuff. If you're not a priori willing to go through it, because it's, it's going to be like, I actually gave myself health complications teaching the science of logic. <laughs> I, it was that, it was that, like I, I developed an eye problem. Like it's only recently gone away. Right. So like, you, it, it's like to actually go into this stuff fully. It, like I spent five years with the phenomenology of spirit. I had to take certain breaks because it was too much. It was, too, it was, you The, the, you will this is a sacrifice you have to make a sacrifice <laughs> you have to make a sacrifice yeah you have to make yeah. and you ha so if but if you're willing <laughs> so you became basically odin huh 
if if you if you're willing to make that sacrifice then you have to be an active reader and i would right. say what that what that, that means is is that i never just i never just read like i'm just sitting there with a book reading i'm always also typing and creating images like right so i've got yes mm -hmm. yeah mm. like i'll make images in powerpoint which become right. which become which become presentations right and 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 note note not taking. afterwards while you're reading you don't read while it i'm reading it's first, all together it's, it's, you're doing it like the first thing or do you read it first and then then go back uh I'm I've I've got two I've got two slides open on my computer all the time one with the text and the other with the creative medium I'm using to bring out the text in a way that helps me make sense of it in a deeper sense mm -hmm. because cool. if I'm just if I'm just reading most of like if I don't know if you pay attention to this but like if you're reading a paragraph of something very dense and complex it's like you can read it and then you're like what did I just read like it just like you know you forget it or you just, like not all the information sinks in so like to me, what helps the information sink in is if I'm also typing about it, writing notes about it at the same time. Yeah. Well, I do find that it, like if, if I really want to get to know a text very well, I have to write about it. Yes. Uh, that, I, that I can't just read it. Uh, otherwise, I get a, I, I just get an abstract, vague version of the text that I'm reading. There's a great... If it's, if it's a complex and difficult text, not just a narrative or a, a story or... There's a great uh, there's a great theory underground article about um, the ethics of our engagement with these liminal web spaces and philosophy and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And here's his principle, and I like it, is in this order, we read, we write, then we talk. Right. Oh. Most people skip to the talking. Right. Yeah. Like imagine well, people ima you say, say, say. N you haven't read a certain thinker, right? Like I haven't read certain thinkers that you've read. So I won't talk on it because I haven't read it. So you read it, you write about it, then you talk about it. Right. Yeah. That's a, I mean, on the other hand, what, that's what we're doing here because, because me and Tom have, have not gone through the, the decrete, but, but I think that you can't read everything. You can't. So, so, so it's, it's okay to get insights from the con here and there if you're not a Lacanian and, and it, it, even if you're focused on something else. Like, it's good to talk to you about this, even yes. if I might not be willing to make the great sacrifice to, at this moment to read Lacan. Absolutely. So I think, that, like, on that point is that, uh, like, I hope that I embody this, but if I don't, it's something that I strive to embody is, if I haven't read a certain thinker, but I can learn from someone who has read a certain thinker, to just have the disposition of, of a certain humbleness or a certain, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about many thinkers, right? And and someone else, like, I, I haven't read Gurdjieff, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Well, we read... might have opinions. That's a, It's too easy to have opinions about things, right? It's very easy And you can pick opinions. up all these opinions because you're part of this kind of like, egregore of opinion in, you know, uh, in, in cyberspace. Sure. And so you have this opinion, but but th that's too easy. Yeah, I, I yeah, think that's it... right. Okay, so, that but, we... okay, so, uh, but, but Kadez, so how, how much does temperament play into the whole, whole kind of thing? Because, I mean, there are obviously different types of approaches to language i mean it's sure. for me for me basically it's very easy to read luman right it just sure. it's just like it just registrates everything because sure. i like the language and then i take a a a, a different uh, uh, author from the same era habermas and it just it just it's just like horrible you, can't, you know yeah, you and i really it, have yeah. you know no it's like i have to really work with it it's not yeah it's not it doesn't it's it's not it's not my language but I, I can I can cherish Habermas nonetheless, but it's a different language. And so you have to have a certain temperament and a certain inclination to language. You like that kind of approach and not that one. So so I, I would presume you have to have an, a, an inclination towards Lacan and Hegel, you know, to that. I think so. Yeah. Hmm. I think so. I think that goes back to that a priori disposition. Like, and this is this is an, an ineffable, in some sense, ineffable dimension of our of our and maybe even a dimension of madness internal to us all is um you know why do we gravitate towards the thinkers and the people that we gravitate towards why do we gravitate away from 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 other people why are you attracted to lumen but not habermas why am i attracted more to like in my doctorate for example i studied both uh zizek's cortex and slaughterdyke's cortex and i just personally emotionally 
for whatever reason, stylistically, I gravitate towards Zizek. It's so fascinating for me. Yeah. I've read everything from Slaughter Dyke. It's just pure poetry for me. Wow. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So, so this yeah. is, why is you're German. Huh? But, why so is why that? is that? I don't. I, I don't. Yeah. But I. But here, I don't. I, I don't have an answer why. But I think we need to love that anyway. Because why we need to love that is because how boring would it be if you you and I both are just oh yeah Slaughter Dyke. But what's more interesting is let's talk about Zizek and Slaughter Dyke. Right. Right. It creates something interesting. Right, that's true. Mm -hmm. Right? So mm -hmm. it's more interesting to have that difference than to have everyone homogenized. No, yeah, ab absolutely. absolutely. I'm just always constantly intrigued by this. In, I don't know if it's inborn, where it comes from, if it's conditioning, what the, this kind of tendency to, to certain themes, to certain languages, to certain imagery. I think know, it's, it's like, the desire of the, I think it's like the desire of the other, like, like there's something about Zizek's style that for whatever reason evokes desire in me. Yeah. Right. And there, and, and there might be something about Slaughter Dyke's style that evokes desire in you for, for, right. yeah. for that, for that way, that? Of, well, way of, I thinking. know in my, in my twenties, I, I read everything of Henry Miller, you know, it was kind of sexy writing too, but, but I, and then I had to read everything that Henry Miller read. Uh, like I had to read Agnes Nin and I had to read all the people that Henry Miller was new and read. And I had to read Dostoevsky and I had to read uh, D.H. Lawrence because these are all the guys that Henry Miller was reading. So I, I couldn't just read Henry Miller. I had to, I had to completely devour his entire universe. And, uh, and then, yeah, that's a good way of saying and it. And then, and then when I started to write, I was writing shitty Henry Miller style prose because <laughs> I was I was a fucking imitator. I couldn't do it. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, so yeah. so so I think I think you you have to devour the the writer uh, yeah. in a sense to the level of possession, yeah. um, and then at certain certain and point, then be like, deep now I've kind of left that behind because it's not really where I'm at right now. You know, not right. because I made a decision to leave it behind. It, it kind of left me or. or it's a very interesting process, but I think it's possession in a way. So it is, it is desire, and it's not something reasonable, and no. nor should it be. Uh, you know, no. yeah, it's madness. It's madness for sure. I, I think I like totally the way good. you were putting that about devouring the devouring Henry Miller and 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 that possession, and then that leads to the imitation, of course. And so I think that's something that I'm trying to teach as well at Philosophy Portal, and also something I'm trying to cultivate in myself is that even though I'm inspired by these thinkers. I want my writing to be distinct, right, right. from from them, and so so I, I try to keep my own style, um, and also I think where where at least for me, um, I sort of bring something unique to the table is that I my background is primarily in science, like my undergrad, my graduate school, and my doctoral training are all, all science. I didn't ever take a philosophy class, so I think that's very unique because. I can bring my scientific background to these philosophers. And I think that in some sense, it allows me to be more clear than someone like Zizek, who can right. be very all over the place. No, yeah. because he's more literary. Or he has a more literary nature. It kind of reminds me of music, too, in the sense that I, I, I couldn't study music in university. I could only do it when I was out. I could only do it outside of university. Whenever I studied music in university. So that, that brought me another perspective on music, whereas... Whereas, uh, so often the out, you're, if you're an outsider to your own field, you have a more powerful uh, perspective on that. That's right. Yeah. I think that's crucial. I, I remember studying people who were specifically that category is people who became out, people who innovated precisely because they were outsiders to the field that they innovated in. Right. Yep. So like there was a, there was a guy I, I, I sort of uh, looked up to at one point, his name was uh, Aubrey de Grey, who's a, uh, I guess, technically a gerontologist now he developed ideas about the aging process but he was originally a computer scientist he didn't study biology and then he went into the field of biology from computer science and he reinvented the field of aging but this type of thing can happen all the time i mean wilbur studied biology as far right. as I, uh, yeah, so. wilbur as well he wasn't really a, yeah wilbur wasn't really uh so in in lacan's either. in lacan's case he was a he was a psychiatrist who invaded the field of psychoanalysis from psychiatry. Mm. And also he had a powerful theological background too, I think, right? Yeah, I'm powerful theological that. and philosophical background. He mm. studied a lot of Descartes. He studied a lot of Spinoza. He studied the ancients. 
He studied a lot of literature. He said uh, if it wasn't for some dumb luck, he would have been like an English teacher or something like that. Mm. Mm. Look, so I guys, wanna... I'm, I'm going to have to wrap this up soon yeah. because I have to get out of here. Can um, I, you want to you, you, you wanna have some last words uh, in regard of your course? When does it start again? Yeah, thanks. The, the course starts September 3rd. Um, I'm really looking forward to it throughout the fall. Basically, if you have Sunday evenings free, Sunday evenings uh, in the fall, then this, and you're also interested in learning about psychoanalysis and you you're, have some interest peaked about specifically Lacan's work, this is definitely the place for you. So every Sunday evening will be lectures, uh, which 13 lectures, which cover the entirety of the accrue. But we also have other features of the course, which I think are incredibly important. There will be four guest lecturers. Um, Isabel Millar, Peter Rollins, Richard Boothby, Todd McGowan, who are all experts in the field in a different way and have been developing ideas with me throughout the entire year. Uh, we've led seminars for the ACRI and the seminars for the ACRI are freely available on my YouTube channel, but all of these thinkers will be developing these ideas. They're just introductory pieces. So they're going to be developing these ideas in the course. We're also going to have exegetical reading spaces, which are going to highlight the most important passages in the Akri, and there'll be spaces where I'm not there, which are led by Dimitri Kroymond, who will take uh, control of that space. Um, and as all the courses, uh, they're organized towards uh, creative participation. So there'll be a conference and an anthology process. So if you're interested in not only learning, but also creating with this uh, in a community context, then uh, philosophyportal.online slash the accre or email me um, and uh, would be happy to have you involved. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Goodell. Uh, Goodell. And uh, yeah, yeah, Goodell is really doing, uh, let's say, living philosophy. It's, it's not merely, merely academic. I try. I appreciate that, Sweeney, as well. And, and as always, I love, uh, I love this podcast. I, I always tune into this podcast and uh, love the work at Parallax.